The conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC, one of Africa's most important countries, continues to be in the news. There have been reports of mass graves discovered in the North Kivu province of the DRC, which saw a lot of fighting between the government forces and the M23 rebel group. Now, multiple reports, including the UN's reports, have indicated that the M23 rebel group is supported by the DRC's neighbor, Rwanda. However, Rwanda has not faced any consequences for it, although it has a long history of supporting such rebel groups and causing a huge amount of death and damage in the DRC. Meanwhile, the East African community, a regional body, has been trying to intervene in the conflict, trying to bring about peace. But there are many questions about the way the EAC is functioning, whether its approaches are actually working. To discuss all this, we have with us our colleague Kambale Musawuli for the Center for Research on the Congo, who has been giving us consistently very important analysis of the situation in the DRC. Kambale, thank you so much for joining us. A lot of developments happening uh, in the DRC. We've seen recent reports by media organizations on uh, mass graves in the, North, in the North Kivu province, of course, on one hand. We've seen that the East African community has deployed, you know, has sent a peace delegation, there are also soldiers, but there's also a lot of discontent with the presence of these very soldiers as well. So maybe first, could you take us through a kind of quick situation on the ground regarding the M23 group? Is the fighting still going on? Uh, you know, have they withdrawn to a particular degree? What's happening on the ground, maybe? For all intended purposes, every time we have to speak about the M23, we have to say that they are a proxy rebel militia, funded, trained, equipped, uh, by the Rwanda military. Numerous UN reports has documented so already. Um, for now, they have uh, withdrawn from some areas uh, that they control uh, based on uh, the negotiation that's been ongoing uh, with different parties, be it with the East African forces or the Congolese government. The African intelligence has just recently published an article uh, documenting how the Congolese uh, government is uh, secretly uh, negotiating with the M23. Uh, so we know there are many efforts to bring them to stop the fighting. Uh, but we have to look at this in this context, right? Congo is a country of over 100 million people. Um, the country has known a conflict for the past two decades. Uh, this conflict is a proxy war by its neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda. And the Congolese people have been held hostage. Uh, they've been held hostage by processes uh, for bringing about peace that does not consider the interests of the Congolese people. There have been so many peace accords signed, um, and these rebels, specifically the M23 and the earlier rendition, be it CNDP or RCD, they have always gone back to the bushes in saying that the Congolese government is not respecting uh, the agreement uh, that they've signed to bring, uh, put down the guns. And when you look at the agreement, uh, one will ask, why is it that every time uh, someone pick up a gun, go to the table, the solution is the killers have to be part of the government. One should ask, why in these negotiations, uh, Congo is losing its sovereignty in providing territory, in providing political positions, not only that, giving uh, amnesty uh, to people who have committed atrocious crimes, such as rape, mass killing, and putting people in graves. See, if you look at uh, just the discovery of the mass graves, which was already known since November of 2022, that in Kishishi, in Bambu, and other areas, that the M23 massacre civilians, put them in mass graves. Congolese citizens have already shared with the world what happened. The UN is investigating. These mass graves are being found. When they will be negotiating again with the M23, after massacring civilians, what are they going to do? Give them again amnesty. This is why all these processes are not uh, holding Right, because it's not taking into account the will, the interests of the Congolese people. It's taking into account the belligerence of the war, their interest uh, first, rather than the interests of the people. Absolutely. Uh, in this context, also looking at uh, Rwandan President Paul Kagame recently traveling to Benin, making some comments as well. So uh, we know that, uh, I mean, it's been, like you said, it's pretty much common knowledge across the world that Rwanda is supporting M23. They have a history of doing it. There are current records which show it. But nonetheless, Kagame has continued to actually, you know, uh, has continued to develop as a vital partner of the West in many of their endeavors, including, uh, you know, maybe taking, handling the refugee crisis, so to speak, which means more atrocities on refugees. So what have been, what have been Kagame's positions as of late? The, it's really important to understand why we have a conflict in the Congo. 
You know, why are there millions of people dying? Millions of Congolese are dying because there is a push to get access to Congo's land and Congo's mineral resources. And in that process, narratives are created. Rwandan President Paul Kagame has been on a tour in West Africa. And in his stop in Benin, he said something that should worry many people around the world, that should worry many Africans, because Rwanda is a member of the African Union. The president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, while in his visit in Benin, was asked by a journalist about the DRC, because it is now clearly known that Rwanda is supporting uh, the rebel forces in the DRC, and Africans are getting to know that too as well. So the question was asked of him. In his response, he says something very bizarre. He put into question the Berlin Conference. It sounds like a normal thing to do. Well, the Berlin Conference is something that was done by the Europeans, right? We should question those things. But he added something much more cynical. He stated that during the Berlin Conference, the land that is the eastern part of Congo belong to Rwanda. Right. So when he says that, he's putting into question the current borders of the African continent, a question that's already been addressed at the African Union. And that question of the borders, uh, the borders of African countries at 1960, every African country that is a member of the African Union, which has signed on to the African Charter, African Union Charter, it says that the borders of African countries that uh, was determined, that, that was existent in 1960, is to be respected. It means that countries are sovereign country. So we, I could go on and explain first how there is a fallacy in um, what he said. I could say, for example, during World War I, it was the Congolese army and the Belgian rule, not the first public, that actually went to Rwanda and liberated Rwanda from uh, German uh, colonialism. Right. Congolese actually went into that territory to free the Rwandans. So it's so interesting that today, um, the Paul Kagame is saying something different. But now that he has said that, it is quite one said, but also eye-opening for people to actually understand what the conflict in the Congo is. There's always been a fear, or uh, sometimes presented as a conspiracy theory, that Rwanda and Uganda are in an operation to balkanize the Congo, to actually make a new country, take Congo's territory, and create a new land that they will call it whatever they want, they would like to call it. So when you hear Rwandan president question Congo's borders, question uh, North Kivu, the existence of North Kivu, a province in the Congo, the existence of South Kivu, another province in the Congo, and Maniema is saying that these are territories um, that belonged to Rwanda before uh, 19, uh, 1885, before the Berlin Conference. Now we know why over 6 million Congolese people have died. And if we are fighting for a free liberated Congo, for a free liberated Africa, we are speaking about Pan-Africanism, Balkanization is not the answer. Absolutely. I would have been much more happier if Rwanda President Paul Kagame said, for example, that he will allow for Rwanda to become an additional province of the Congo. And that other African countries are coming together in regional blocks to create a federation of states where in the final, final stage, the African continent as a block will be a union, you know, a Pan-African union fighting for the interest of the African people. That is not what he's saying. He's actually advocating for carving up African states smaller and smaller, which means weakening uh, these countries. And then, of course, opening up access to, uh, to the lands for the interests of the Rwandan elite and also uh, the agents in the West, specifically those who are in London, uh, in the United Kingdom, and those who are in Paris, in France, and those who are in Washington, D.C., in the United States. But has there been any pressure from the West, from its traditional allies, that is, we're talking about Kagame here, regarding what is happening in the DRC, because we do know that some years ago, there was some kind of pressure put on him, which led to some conclusion of the war in 2012, for instance. There have been pressure on Paul Kagame, but that pressure has to be contextualized. Right? The pressure has come from different sides. Then at the same time, it's a, a double-edged sword. On one end, they are putting pressure, but on the other, they're not taking action. So in the case of the United States, uh, Secretary Blinken 
has actually put pressure on the Rwandan government, one, to free political prisoners in Rwanda, and the second one is to stop supporting rebel groups in the Congo. But the United States continued to support the Rwandan military. They continued to provide military uh, aid to them. And then the UN reporters documenting that the M23 have sophisticated weapons, such as night vision goggles, uh, um, missiles that have greater range, that even uh, Antonio Guterres, the U.S. Secretary General, in an interview that he gave to France 24, stated that the United Nations forces, do, they do not have the capacity to fight the M23 because they are sophisticated weapon. Okay. So for the U.S., it's all words to me. The same thing for the United Kingdom. Yes, they have made statements saying that Rwanda should stop supporting rebel group in the Congo. The same thing with France. They have also made statements that Rwanda should stop supporting the M23 rebel group. But what did the uh, European Union do? In the beginning of the year, they provided Rwanda with 20 million euros worth of military support for Rwanda's operation in Mozambique. And while they are in Mozambique, they are serving French interests. They are there really to protect the interests of the French oil company Total and not actually to help the people of Mozambique. So we are seeing the denunciation. We are seeing the strong condemnation. We are not seeing actions, and we know what works. We know that in 2012, when international pressure was put on Rwanda, where they withheld aid to Rwanda, they withheld military aid to Rwanda, the M23 disappeared. The M23 is back with mighty support, and the action that was done in 2012 is not happening. So for me, the is being made by this statement, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, the action is following these uh, words that Western nations are, pro are professing at the moment. Right, I'm finally also taking a look at the East African community. We know that EAC soldiers are on the ground there. There was a peace delegation. But how is the Congolese population and the political establishment kind of responding to the EAC initiative? Does it seem like it's working or does it seem like just another attempt at, you know, the words like you said? Yes. Congo joined the East African community um, and is the biggest member of the East African community. It has a, also the biggest population with 100 million uh, people. So the joining of the DRC in the East African community brought about more hope for people in the East African community than in the, uh, with the Congolese people. Uh, one, most Congolese are not informed of this process. The ordinary Congolese was not consulted uh, in the decision of becoming a member of that. Second, the decisions to join did not necessarily go to the parliament in an open discussion. So the parliament, of course, signed and sent members of parliament that did not engage in discussing what it actually meant. And in Congo joining the East African community, we lost a form of sovereignty. There was hope that the solutions coming out of the East African community would take into account Congo's history, the belligerent rather than Uganda. In the solutions being proposed by the East African community, they're not understanding that Rwanda and Uganda, members of the ESC, are actually the belligerent force causing the chaos. So solutions for peace in the DRC, when they are saying they are going to send the troops to uh, stop the M23 rebel group, you have Ugandan soldiers as part of the military force. It does not make any sense, right? Because they have, Congo actually have taken uh, Uganda to the International Court of Justice and we won a 300 million judgment for uh, the actions of war crimes, crimes against humanity and pillaging of Congo's resources while they were occupying the Congo in the 2000s. Right? So we, they are already a belligerent force and they continue to support rebel force. Second one is uh, Rwanda is part of the discussion around the military operations. On one hand, the United Nations is saying that Rwanda is supporting militarily the M23. On the other hand, the East African community coming up with a strategy to stop the M23 has the country supporting the M23. It will never work, right? So we do know that it's not going to work, everything that they are doing. It will not work until the fundamental question of justice is addressed. What we bring about peace in the justice? 
It's not a new military force coming from the East African community. We had the best force coming into the Congo in 2012, right? It was the SADC forces that they called the Force Intervention Brigade, FIB. It was composed of South Africans, Namibians, Zimbabweans. These forces came and stopped the M23 in 2012. They put military pressure on the political problem. So as they put the military pressure on the uh, political problem, they achieved some goals. But how do we explain a decade later, we are talking about the M23. So we know that the military action is not going to stop the situation. But we believe because there is a culture of impunity. Those who committed a crime yesterday are continuing to commit crime today. Right? And as they are committing crime today and no one is holding them accountable, it gives them a green light, a fervor, as we say in French, to continue to commit this crime. So if we don't address the question of justice, mm -hmm. we will continue to have a war in the Congo. And the Congolese people, we support the process of creating an international tribunal for DRC to hold perpetrators of the violence accountable, be it Congolese, be it our neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, and be it the international actors, uh, corporations who have been involved uh, in the conflict in the Congo. As long as we don't have justice, we will continue to have a uh, conflict in the Congo. This is, of course, why the ESC solution is not working in the ERC. Right, Kambale, thank you so much for that analysis. Uh, like you pointed out, many media reports showing this conflict as just merely fighting between a certain rebel group and the government, often missing out some of the underlying issues you talked about, the loot of mineral resources, the question of justice, without which peace really, like you said, cannot be considered. Thank you so much. We'll get back to you with the situation on the DRC soon.